The origin of the Vigilante program can be loosely traced to an event that would become America's answer to Pearl Harbor. On the afternoon of April 18, 1942, Jimmy Doolittle and his crack volunteer group prepared to embark on a surprise attack on Tokyo. This was no ordinary air raid. The attack was to be carried out by 16 Army Air Corps bombers. The carrier plows through heavy seas. One bomber after another soars from the flight deck, pointed for Japan. The sea grows rougher, the weather worse, but not one plane fails to get into the air. Taking the gale in its teeth, each bomber sets its course for carefully prearranged military objectives in Japan. Deployed from an unlikely airstrip, the USS Hornet, the events of that rainy afternoon were unprecedented. Not only because of the unique inter-service cooperation, but it proved that a Navy carrier was an effective platform for long-range bombing. The American strategy was effective. Doolittle's raiders had dealt an important psychological blow to a seemingly invulnerable adversary. The role of the aircraft carrier in this attack would not be forgotten. Just three years later, American planes again dropped bombs on Japan. Only this time, the symbolism of the attack was overshadowed by the destructive power of the weapon used. The onset of a nuclear age brought with it a change in military thinking. Having delivered the final blow to Japan, the US Air Force assumed the mantle as a sole possessor of the nuclear endgame. As a post-war euphoria gave way to a Cold War reality, B-47 and later Boeing B-52 Stratofortress were fit with the role of nuclear delivery. Long-range strategic bombing became a defensive priority. Now equipped with an aircraft that could reach the Soviet heartland from American bases, the aircraft carrier was deemed redundant. Struggling to find a role in the era of the strategic bomber, the Navy put forth a nuclear-capable aircraft of its own. The North American A.J. Savage was clearly the result of the desire for a nuclear bomber combined with an inherent distrust of pure jet aircraft. The two propulsion engines provided the security of low-speed carrier operations, while a single jet engine mounted in the center of the fuselage provided the speed, with two turning and one burning. The Savage was a clever hybrid. However, by the time it reached the carrier decks, it was already becoming obsolete. By 1949, the Douglas Company had begun developing its jet-powered follow-on, the A3D Sky Warrior. When the Navy ordered the Douglas Sky Warrior in 1949, it was clear that pure jet propulsion was gaining thrust aboard carrier decks. Like most early nuclear bombers, the Sky Warrior was a massive plane. 76 feet in length and 72 foot wingspan made it the largest plane ever to be deployed from the deck of a carrier. However, like most early large jets, the Sky Warrior was relatively slow. Unable to reach supersonic speeds, it was deemed vulnerable to rapidly improving Soviet air defense. Because of its sheer size, the Sky Warrior was disliked by deck handlers. The absence of an ejection system was unsettling to its three crew members. In fact, many pilots joked that the 3D stood for all three dead. While the mammoth Sky Warrior assumed the more passive roles of electronic warfare and tanking, the Navy set out to find a nuclear bomber that would go faster than ever before. At the North American Aviation Plant in Columbus, Ohio, the challenge of creating a new nuclear bomber was given full priority. Headed by Frank Compton, the Columbus designers took the initiative in preempting the Navy's request for a new bomber. Beginning with sketches and slide rules, the small group delved enthusiastically into the uncharted waters of the aerodynamic unknown. By 1954, the implications of technological growth had a profound effect on the American bomber tactics. 
advancements in radar-guided surface-to-air missiles had all but nullified the safety of high altitudes. With this in mind, the Navy conducted a secretive mission to explore the alternative to a high-altitude nuclear attack. On this mission, an AJ Savage would take off from Spain, fly all the way to Paris, and back. Under the French radar, the plane was never detected. The implications of a low-altitude penetration for nuclear delivery were noticed by the engineers of Columbus. This low-altitude requirement was not incorporated into their initial design, which was dubbed the North American General Purpose Attack Weapon, or NAGPA. We initially designed what we, uh, a low-altitude uh, version uh, with all of the systems in it, the inertial navigation, uh, <coughs> the automatic uh, systems, uh, we had the rocket engine in it, and all of those things, and we called that the NAGPA, and that was presented to the Navy in 1953. So the Navy in studied it, it was our own un unsolicited proposal, and they thought, well, that's a good idea to do all of those things, which we ended up doing in the vigilante, but they said, how about making it supersonic? So we packed our bags and went home for about a year, and then came back with a supersonic version, which is the present-day vigilante. The North American design was dubbed the A3J. The intended role of the A3J was simple. It would penetrate the Soviet heartland, bringing with it a nuclear bomb. Its blazing speed would be the key to its survival. The quest for higher speeds resulted in an airframe like no other at the time. North American test pilot Ed Gillespie remembers his first impressions of the vigilante. In those days, we always felt if an airplane looked good, it was going to fly good. Well, the Vigilante certainly looked good. It looked like it was going Mach 2 and it was sitting on the deck. I couldn't believe that our engineering staff could stuff all the goodies in it that they finally did and still make the airplane carrier suitable or have the range of the legs that uh, we finally ended up with. But it was such a good-looking airplane, and it still is to this day, that uh, you just wanted it. It was a Cadillac of the fleet. The Navy's requirements were stringent, to say the least. The Vigilante needed to be launched from a carrier with zero headwind, yet it also needed to cruise beyond Mach 2. Aerodynamically, this was a contradiction. The lift required for the carrier takeoff suggests the need for larger wings. However, larger wing areas prevent the plane from reaching high speeds. Engineers cope with this dilemma by making the wing much thinner than was generally accepted. It was argued by some that the aerodynamic compromises put forth in the Vigilante were drawbacks created by an overly stringent navy. After all, since the aircraft carriers are generally moving, it would be extremely rare for a plane to be catapulted with zero headwind. This requirement was later relaxed, but not until after the engineering staff had taken extraordinary steps in making a flexible airframe that would revolutionize the way military aircraft are designed. While the Vigilante was taking shape, the Air Force was making progress on their own supersonic bomber programs. Aircraft evolution during the Cold War was rapid. The mighty B-52 was soon to be outperformed by the B-58 Hustler. The Hustler was not only supersonic, it could fly at Mach 2. However, just as the Hustler was entering service, the Air Force began the quest for even higher speeds. Here, at the North American Aviation Plant in Palmdale, California, a new airplane was taking shape. The B-70 Valkyrie promised to be the fastest bomber in the world. The Strategic Air Command was enamored by its potential. By 1964, they would have a bomber that would be impossible to catch. Nine thousand miles away, the American bomber programs were already making an impression. The American pursuit of supersonic bombers posed a great challenge to the Soviet military. Soviet airspace was immense, and an unwelcome bomber could penetrate the vast areas between air bases guarding the border. If a Mach 2 bomber were to penetrate, 
it would be nearly impossible for even the fastest Soviet fighter of the time to catch it. Soviet aircraft design bureaus revolted into the task of creating the ultimate fighter, a plane that could catch and destroy America's fastest bomber. Back at the Columbus plant, the vigilante was beginning to take shape. By 1958, it was clear that this plane was revolutionary. It was the first plane to fly by wire controls, the first to have a heads-up display, terrain avoidance, and a fully integrated inertial navigation, bombing, and electric warfare system. Advanced aluminum alloys were also introduced. However, of all the vigilantes' firsts, there is one that few people know about. One of the things that we did in 1955 was look at the so-called stealth characteristics of the airplane, which now are high, high tech. And we checked the airplane. We built a range out here on the airfield where we could put a model and we could rotate the model, it was a copper screen model, and, and uh, impinge uh, radar signals onto it and measure the feedback. So we would rotate the model, and we'd des actually design the airplane so that its radar reflectivity was concentrated at two points off of each side of the wingtips. And of course, when you're flying by something, well, you get a flash, but you don't get a large response. So we actually designed stealth into the vigilante. Back in Moscow, the design bureaus of MiG and Sukhoi were commissioned to develop an interceptor that could deal with the American threat. Despite differences in both culture and language between the United States and the Soviet Union, aerodynamics are universal. When different engineers independently strive for a similar requirement, their conclusions will also be similar. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that as early as 1958, the same year that the Vigilante first took to the air, Soviet engineers were filmed studying a model similar in design to that of the Vigilante. Despite the work done by Soviet designers on their own, it is likely that Columbus, Ohio frequently became the unofficial host of the KGB agents. It would be hard for them to miss the sleek American bomber sitting out on the tarmac. They could have stood out here on the airport and taken pictures of it in 1958 when we made our first flight. There are really nothing covert about the vigilante as far as its being there, and certainly the characteristics of it were secret, um, but uh, the shape of it, uh, looking at it, so I'm, I'm sure they had plenty of people, which they had all over the world, standing out here at Columbus, uh, taking pictures of every airplane. Nikolai Matchuk and Lev Shalengaya of the MiG Design Bureau were put in charge of the Soviet answer to the American bombers. An interceptor needs to be faster than the plane it chases. Therefore, MiG designers began the ambitious construction of a fighter that could push beyond Mach 3. This daunting task faced by the Soviets was aggravated by the progress being made back of the States. On the last day of August 1958, North American test pilot Dick Wenzel took to the air over Columbus. After the maiden flight, the vigilante's prowess as a speedster began to truly shine. In June of 1960, famed aviatrix Jackie Cochran climbed into the back seat of the vigilante, becoming the first woman to fly beyond Mach 2. Later that year, the vigilante set yet another record when Commander Leroy Heath climbed to over 91,000 feet while carrying a 2,200-pound payload. Although the Navy was enamored by the vigilante's performance, Certain residents of the southeastern Ohio were less impressed. We broke a lot of windows in the early days. Uh, uh, one lady sued us because of the loss of her parrot, had a heart attack, I recall that. Uh, we also had a, a, a very definite problem with a, a, a gentleman down in the southeastern Ohio who owned a dynamite factory, and uh, it was right under our supersonic corridor. And uh, he finally realized who was causing the, he was losing so many man hours to people bailing out the windows and so on when we would shock his employees that uh, he finally got in touch with us and said, please, 
I think it's you guys. Don't do it anymore. And indeed, we did move our quarter away from him, and, uh, and he, uh, he thanked us. He, he wasn't losing the time anymore. To a pilot flying a new plane, the ejection seat is the most important piece of equipment on board. Bucking the trend toward the British Martin Baker variety, North American designed its own. And in fact, came up with the first seat to safety eject the pilot both above and below the speed of sound. A Navy pilot is not necessarily in the air when he needs to get out of the plane. In the dangerous world of carrier operations, escaping from a submerged plane can be the key to survival. Dramatic footage shows both crew members successfully ejecting at zero altitude, however the system was not error-free. One time, I was flying at 42,000 feet on a first production flight, and a misrigged canopy, and this is the only time it ever happened, I might add, uh, suddenly blew off. Uh, I lost my canopy at 42,000 feet at 1.42 Mach. And of course, it was stunned me. It just, just and it was explosive decompression. I was alone. Uh, explosive decompression. And when I finally, and I realized, I thought I had ejected. Um, but uh, seconds later, I realized I hadn't. I throttled back. Speed brakes out. Uh, my, my visor was down fully. My mask was on very tight. Of course, explosive decompression kicked it out. But when I finally got out of control, I realized it was still in the airplane, and the airplane was unhurt, it, uh, except that I was open cockpit. So therefore, I claim, and nobody's ever, ever... I don't believe that anybody's ever come close, but we have the fastest open cockpit flying record. At the beginning of 1961, two vigilantes were moved from Columbus, Ohio to Kirtland Air Force Base to begin the program's most difficult and complex series of tests, bomb delivery. The method employed to release a bomb remains perhaps the most bizarre chapter in the vigilante story. Instead of dropping bombs like a conventional bomber, the bomb was ejected straight out through an opening in the tail of the plane. In the early 50s, high and fast were the most important elements in a bombing attack. However, with improvements in air defense systems, it became apparent that Sneaking under the radar was the safer bet. For pilots carrying a nuclear bomb, this meant learning some extraordinary tactics. Our initial method was to fly the airplane straight and level at Mach 2 at 70,000 feet and drop the, the bomb out of the back of the airplane. As it would come out, the tail cone would come off the airplane, the bomb would come out like this and, and then go, and of course the airplane was at 70,000 feet, there was, so there wasn't an escape problem up there. Uh, later on, of course, then we also decided that we could come in low, right on the deck, and, uh, and, pitch, and, and automatically or manually program the airplane up into about a 40 degree attitude where the bomb would then come out, and as the airplane continued, the bomb would come off and go towards the target, the airplane would then continue around and do an Emmelman turn and, and, then, and then go the other way and escape. The other way was an over the shoulder where you hit the target, you were right over the target, this was your IP, your initial point, you pull up right there and right over the target, you released the bomb, you continued around like this, the bomb would go straight up and come straight down and luckily by the time it hit you, you were off and away. For pilots, these hair-raising maneuvers were taxing enough without having to worry about finding and hitting the target. This was a job for the radar attack navigator, or RAN, who sat in the back seat. Responsible for target and checkpoint acquisition, terrain avoidance, and a host of other duties. The RAN is crucial to the mission. The fact that the, the RAN, or the radar attack navigator, was in a compartment uh, completely isolated behind the pilot with no front view meant, meant that you had to work very hard at coordinating the mission, getting your uh, cockpit to cockpit chatter uh, down to where it was both brief but informative. 
Uh, and as the navigator in the back would uh, run sensors, navigate the airplane, the pilot in front is uh, looking for visual cues and maneuvering the target in the end game. It was a wonderful experience uh, to, uh, to form the teaming that you saw between pilots and navigators. Before each mission, Iran sets the course the pilot will follow en route to the target. Flying below radar means that mountains are as dangerous as the enemy defenses. This is especially true at night or in poor weather. Former vigilante pilot Captain Joe Dyer is well aware of the importance of the man who sat behind him. Well, I think the RAN that uh, is responsible for me being here today was uh, made up for one of those lapses in attention. Uh, I was a young aviator. We were flying low altitude and high speed, and after a few hundred hours, you got too comfortable at doing that. And I was looking down at a chart or my kneeboard card. The nose of the airplane dipped a little bit. The guy in the back seat says, hey, Joe, watch your attitude. Uh, I looked down 50 feet. Recovered. Nighttime, by the way. I gently recovered. Didn't say anything about it, but my knees were knocking in the front. And I remember thinking as we turned to the next target and the navigator was talking to me, gosh, you ought to be quiet. You know, you're almost dead back there. During an attack, checkpoints such as islands or mountains were displayed on a television system. Such checkpoints were used to ensure the pilot was keeping true to course. Because onboard radar defeats the purpose of trying to remain invisible, the navigator was given a state-of-the-art interior navigation system that provided him an accurate reading of his location, without betraying his position. To ensure that the plane was keeping true to its course, the navigator would occasionally flash his radar to verify checkpoints and correct any navigational error. Should enemy interceptors pick up the radar flashes, an electronic countermeasure indicator will warn the pilot of incoming fighters. It will then confuse enemy radar by emitting false information concerning the whereabouts of the vigilante. Back in Moscow, the new Soviet interceptor had moved from the drawing board to tarmac. 6th of March, 1964, Mikoyan Design Bureau test pilot Alexander Fidotov makes the maiden flight of the 155R1. I remember that day very well. We had a potential accident during that maiden flight. It was quite cold, about minus 12 degrees Celsius. Earlier, we'd installed sensors on the aircraft to test the flight systems in flight. We had a remote health checking system in the sensors, and soon after takeoff, I got a warning indication that the fuel pumps weren't working. Afterwards, it appeared that an important fuel agent hadn't been added to the aircraft tanks. It was a sort of antifreeze for kerosene. As you know, kerosene contains water, and during the flight, the water froze in the pumps. Luckily, Fedotov managed to turn back to the aerodrome and land. He was very lucky to have had enough available fuel to get back. If the flight had been longer, the engines would have been shut down. Its similarity to the Vigilante is obvious, the major difference being in the large twin vertical fins. MiG designers had less success than their American counterparts when it came to dealing with high-speed stability. This problem would plague the Russians for years to come. Back in Columbus, the Vigilante's problems were political, not aerodynamic. The Air Force had long argued that the strategic attack role was exclusively an Air Force mission. The Navy disagreed. By 1960, discourse over the Navy's role in the strategic mission had snowballed into the bitter inter-service, rivalry, and debate. The vigilante was a casualty. The Air Force convinced Congress that the Navy shouldn't have a strategic mission, and so we converted the airplane from a 70,000-foot Mach 2 airplane very successfully to a low-altitude, long-range reconnaissance airplane. Enter the RA-5, R being reconnaissance. The shift from attack to reconnaissance took place just as the vigilante was entering service with the Navy. The first vigilantes were delivered to Naval Air Station Sanford in Florida in 1961. By January of the following year, they entered squadron service. During this period, 
The heated debate over whether the Navy should have a role in the nuclear deterrent cast a shadow on the vigilante's long-awaited arrival into fleet service. Anticipating that the Air Force would get its way, the Navy recognized its potential in a very different role. The Vigilante was well suited for the role of aerial reconnaissance. Fully loaded with cameras, the recon pilot's only defense is speed. Capable of blazing beyond Mach 2, the Vigilante was clearly fast enough for the job. However, even more important than speed was the fact that it could be launched from a carrier. Unrestricted by the diplomatic and logistical problems encountered when operating from foreign airfields, the Vigilante gave naval intelligence and eye in all corners around the world. This airplane carried uh, uh, fixed focal length cameras from 3 inches out to 12 inches, had an 18 inch panoramic camera that would let you stand miles offshore but still get excellent photography of uh, areas of interest. It was also an all weather machine because it had in that canoe underneath the airplane uh, a side looking radar or an image forming radar that uh, would go uh, through clouds that would bring back uh, uh, image quality or reconnaissance quality uh, photography. The 18-inch pan camera would give you wonderful standoff, almost the quality of today's uh, space cameras in that you could read a, uh, a license plate in uh, downtown, probably still classified cities, uh, coastal cities at, uh, at, at great distance. In 1964, the first reconnaissance vigilantes joined the fleet. During this period, the Cold War was again heating up, and there was no shortage of areas upon which the government wanted to keep a close eye on. When the vigilante returned to the ship, intelligence information recorded on tape and film are rushed into a highly specialized group of rooms several floors below the flight deck. This area, known as the Integrated Operational Intelligence Center, is where all the processing and interpretation takes place. The vigilante pilots had three basic ways of gathering intelligence. One was to fly at very high altitudes to get a picture of activity deep within enemy territory. Another way was to briefly sneak across the beach very low to obtain a detailed picture of enemy defenses several miles inland. The third was a short-range beach reconnaissance to give details of possible landing assault. All of the sensory data, whether optical or non-optical, was correlated and analyzed in conjunction with each other to provide an integrated analysis of the hostile military activity. Such intelligence is then passed on to the air wing. From this information, tactical mission planning or orders of battle can be prepared and effectively carried out. If an airstrike is called for, the attacking planes will know exactly which targets to attack and which radar signature to jam. The information provided by the vigilante is tactical, meaning that it gives a continuous and updated picture of the enemy during a wartime situation. Tactical recon was nothing new to the U.S. Navy. During World War II, Navy Wildcats were fit to carry large cameras. Stationed at forward bases in the South Pacific, photo pilots flew over Japanese Hell Islands before an amphibious assault. Navy bomber pilots studied the photographs and picked their targets before setting on their way. During the Korean War, aerial reconnaissance missions were being flown off the decks of carriers. Photographic versions of the Grumman F9F Panther brought back detailed pictures of Kim Il-sung's task forces, supply depots, anti-aircraft batteries, and troop concentrations. Later in the war, these same cameras would photograph large-scale troop buildups in the north. Troops that were discovered to be Chinese. 
From before the Inchon landing, and through to the end of hostilities, photographic intelligence proved to be a decisive factor. The prevailing notion that the atomic bomb would deter any future conflicts had been proven false. The carrier emerged once again as the long arm of the US military and reconnaissance planes became the eye of the fleet. Following the Korean War, US foreign policy was directed to another area of the world, the Middle East. In July of 1958, civil unrest in Lebanon threatened the already precarious political standing in the region. Also, some 2,500 Americans were living in and around the Beirut area. In preparation for an amphibious landing, photographic versions of the F-9F Cougar took over the skies of Lebanon, bringing back detailed pictures of troop buildups along the Damascus Road leading from Syria. These pictures were then used to determine exactly where the Marines should come ashore. While Navy planes were busy with tactical reconnaissance, the Air Force was keeping an eye on the U.S. military's main area of interest, the Soviet Union. On May 1, 1960, a Lockheed U-2 took off from Pakistan on a high-altitude recon mission that would dramatically change the defense relationships between the United States and the Soviet Union. The U-2, flown alone by France's Gary Powers, never made it to Norway. On May 5th, Nikita Khrushchev announced that Powers' U-2 had been brought down 1,400 miles inside Soviet territory. Khrushchev charged America with deliberate aggression, and stated that the world could be pushed to the brink of war. The ill-fated spy flight was a diplomatic disaster for the Eisenhower administration. For the State Department, it meant apologies and damage control. For the Pentagon, however, it revealed the need for a faster spy plane. When the Central Intelligence Agency was in charge of strategic reconnaissance missions, the vigilante was being readied for the entrance into the fleet. Its prowess in the areas of speed and altitude had not gone unnoticed by the CIA. After all, the plane had been initially designed to penetrate Soviet airspace with a nuclear bomb on board. If it could penetrate Soviet airspace with a nuclear bomb, it could certainly do so with cameras. New engines specifically designed to sustain the plane at a high-altitude supersonic dash were considered by both the Navy and the CIA. However, as the CIA project was still in the planning stages, a conflict in a different part of the world was beginning to boil. Over. Destroyer was carrying out a, a mission of patrol in those waters, in international waters. When it was attacked, it replied to the attack. It continued to carry out its mission today and will do so the remainder of this week. In the same waters, the president has asked the destroyer force be doubled and with an air cap, a combat air patrol, be available at all times on call to it, and as I think you know, he's issued instructions that in the event of a further attack upon our vessels in international waters, we are to respond with the objective of destroying the attackers. On August 5th, 1964, the Vietnam War unofficially began. Airstrikes targeted North Vietnamese fuel deposits, suspected military installations, bridges, and roadways. However, there was one major problem. Maps of North Vietnam were notoriously inaccurate. In some instances, these maps were as much as four miles in error. The problem this presented to American pilots is obvious. On the ground, American troops were forced to adapt to the guerrilla tactics they faced in both jungles and towns. From the day the first American soldiers set foot in Vietnam, it was clear that fighting such an elusive enemy would prove difficult. A decade of war had left the North Vietnamese well adapted to an ambush style of warfare. Inaccurate maps aggravated the problem for American soldiers. 
errors up to four miles created confusion about the location of crucial landmarks like hills, rivers, and villages. Precision is imperative in close air support. With absolutely no room for error, the need for accurate maps was never more clear. The vigilante pilots entered the war in late 1964 aboard the USS Ranger. Shortly thereafter, additional vigilante squadrons joined the combat area aboard the USS Kitty Hawk, Enterprise Forest Stall, Constellation, and America. The first task of the vigilante crews was to solve the problem of poor intelligence and inaccurate maps. In just a two-week period, the vigilante collected the imagery of the entire Vietnamese area, providing the U.S. military with reliable maps for the first time. However, what the maps did not show was the complex network of trails and bridges upon which the North Vietnamese funneled supplies to the south. The Ho Chi Minh Trail frustrated the American military. Cutting off this relentless flow of supplies became a priority. However, finding it was a different story. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was not one trail, but a vast network of trails. Complicating this was the fact that most of these trails were shrouded in a thick jungle canopy. Despite this, US warplanes took aim at whatever appeared to be part of this vast supply route. As the war progressed, the Ho Chi Minh Trail would become the focus of the most concentrated bombing campaigns of the entire war. Despite the onslaught of bombs, supplies continued to pour into the south. In an attempt to reveal North Vietnamese supply routes, American planes began dumping massive amounts of what was then deemed to be non-toxic defoliant. The use of Agent Orange proved difficult and ineffective. A much cleaner way of looking within the jungle canopy was carried out by the vigilante. The infrared sensors aboard the plane could pick up heat energy from trucks or other activity in the trail. In the first months of the war, the vigilante had earned a reputation as an exceptional recon plane. However, it had also established a less flattering reputation. Because of its sheer size and high landing speed, the vigilante was notoriously difficult to bring aboard a carrier. Uh, the vigilante community was made up of outstanding aviators, but that's because we very quickly weeded out those that had trouble at, uh, uh, at the carrier. The carrier, to this day, is the most demanding aspect of naval aviation, and that's where vigilante pilots, the successful ones, absolutely excelled. By the cessation of bombing in 1968, the Rolling Thunder policies had transformed many areas of North Vietnam into a decimated moonscape. But the North Vietnamese proved resilient, as rebuilding commenced immediately when the planes disappeared. Working in conjunction with American bombers became the primary role of vigilante crews. Before an attack, vigilante pilots would fly over a likely North Vietnamese target. After the bombing run, the vigilante would again fly over the target to assess the damage. Because he enjoyed the element of surprise, the vigilante pilot usually encountered little resistance before an attack. However, the post-strike flyover was a different matter. Some of the airplanes in Vietnam were lost <coughs> because... Uh, their, their tactics were to follow up a bomb delivery uh, mission with reconnaissance, and pretty soon the Vietnamese were smart and they knew that after they got a few bombs, they were also going to get a vigilante. After a massive bombing raid, North Vietnamese gunners were ready at the trigger. In the north, anti-aircraft defenses were formidable. 
The sound of an American plane would cause the sky to erupt into a violent hail of artillery. The policy of post-strike reconnaissance proved costly. In fact, more vigilantes were lost over Vietnam than any other Navy plane during the war. Eleven of the 18 airplanes lost were attributed to anti-aircraft artillery. Proof that when flying at low levels, even the fastest and most sophisticated airplane is vulnerable to the oldest form of anti-aircraft defense. The pieces of the airplanes seen on the boat are from a vigilante that left the USS Kitty Hawk on its last mission. May 19, 1967 Vigilantes were flown off the decks of carriers up until the ceasefire in 1973. Designed to fly against the best Soviets had to offer, the vigilante spent most of its career flying against a more ambiguous enemy over the skies of Southeast Asia. For American pilots, this was typical Cold War reality. During the brush fires and wars of containment that characterized the Cold War, the aircraft carrier was the strong arm of American foreign policy. For almost 20 years, the vigilante was the eye of the fleet. And during this tenure, the vigilante community developed a distinguished reputation. The vigilante community really was just that. It was a small group of about a dozen fleet squadrons, one replacement air group, which serviced both East Coast and West Coast ships out of, first of all, Sanford, Florida, then we moved up. Uh, to Albany, Georgia, and finally down in Key West, where we finally wrapped up the show. But it was a small community in that everyone knew everybody, and we had our full collection of characters. Uh, we had probably had uh, a resident village idiot or two. Uh, we had uh, bears with sore heads, but far and away, the community was made up of very, very professional people that epitomized what in the uh, aviation business we call crew coordination. In 1979, the vigilante retired from service with the Navy. Without question, it was the most effective and successful reconnaissance airplane ever to operate off the deck of a carrier. Even by standards extent, nearly two decades after its heyday, the vigilante's level of performance remains extraordinary. The technological and mechanical sophistication introduced by its designers have left a distinct impression on modern aviation. One of the Vigilante's major design firsts were its horizontal ramp intakes for its engines. Such intakes are now commonplace on military planes. One look at the Navy's F-14 Tomcat reveals how much was borrowed from the sleek design of the Vigilante. The Air Force's mighty F-15 Eagle has also borrowed heavily from the four-sided vigilante designers. But whatever became of the once-feared Soviet MiG-25, the Foxbat? About a year ago, there was a picture of a, uh, a Foxbat uh, reconnaissance version. And of course, the Foxbat looks very much like the Vigilante, and it also has the same canoe on the bottom of it and so forth that our RA-5C had. So I think today, they are continuing to have a reconnaissance system, which we no longer have. The MiG-25 had a fate similar to the Vigilante. When it emerged, it was deemed one of the fastest and most daunting aircraft in the world. However, like the Vigilante, it was used most effectively when carrying cameras rather than bombs or missiles. When the Vigilante retired, with it went the Navy's ability to take an integrated picture of the battlefield. During Operation Desert Storm, it would be satellites, not airplanes, that kept an eye on the movements of Iraqi troops and scuds. However, satellites have their drawbacks. Desert Storm, one of the big lessons learned, quote, was tactical reconnaissance. And uh, they still in Desert Storm had to try to get satellite data 
to Washington and back to Desert Storm, which was a day later instead of an hour later. Satellite has a little problem getting electronic intelligence because it only goes over once every hour and a half, you know. We can be there continuously and know exactly where we are. With the end of the Cold War, there are now signs that dedicated tactical reconnaissance may be re-emerging as a defense priority. In the tradition of the Vigilante, an unmanned reconnaissance system currently under development promises to give the battlefield commanders an eye in the sky. show general operating procedures for the A3J Vigilante on the ground and in flight. Specific operating procedures will be established by your squadron doctrine. Before each flight, make a visual check of the general external condition of the airplane. If you're flying without a bombardier navigator, check his cockpit for security and proper switch position. Set the IFF master selector to normal and the mode selector switches as desired. In the pilot's cockpit, give the ejection seat a thorough check. See that the parachute deployment lanyard is securely attached to the seat and that the emergency canopy jettison air bottle reads about 3,000 PSI. Make sure that the gas line quick disconnects on each side of the seat are secure. As you get squared away in the cockpit, check that the emergency oxygen gauge reads about 1800 PSI. Ensure that the safety pins are removed from the face curtain, the canopy jettison handle, and the two hand grips. Take your time and check carefully each item on your pre-start checklist. If you wish to start the left engine first, place the number one engine master switch on and set the number one engine starter switch momentarily to start. If there is no RPM indication within 10 seconds, put the starter switch to stop and investigate. If the start is normal, the RPM will begin to rise slowly. As the engine reaches about 10%, place the throttle in idle. If the engine fails to light off, or if the exhaust gas temperature exceeds starting limits, abort the start by placing the throttle to off and the starter switch to stop. During a normal start, the ignition and starting air will shut off automatically at about 45%. However, as a precaution, place the engine starter switch momentarily to stop. The engine will stabilize at about 67% RPM. Check instruments for normal readings. Repeat the starting procedure for the other engine. With both engines at idle, give the signal to disconnect external power. Perform the after-start cockpit check. Extend the speed brakes. 
With the pitch trim at zero degrees, drop the flaps to 50 degrees. This will automatically close the speed brakes to 8 degrees, activate the boundary layer control system, and reset pitch trim 8 degrees nose down. Check the hydromechanical, electrical, and pitch org systems. Cycle the stick and rudder to assure proper control surface movement. Depress the electrical flight control system disable button and check for shift to the hydromechanical system. Reset the electrical and pitch org systems. Return the flaps to cruise position and check that the speed brakes are fully closed. Before leaving the line, check your alternate trim and normal trim systems. Check the trim indicators for correct movement. As you taxi out, use nose wheel steering and brakes as required. When the takeoff checklist has been completed and you are in takeoff position, advance the throttles to military and check instruments for normal readings. Release the brakes and use nose wheel steering as required for directional control until the vertical stabilizer becomes effective at approximately 60 knots. Lift the nose wheel at about 135 knots. The airplane will fly off at about 145 knots. When safely airborne and below 230 knots, retract the landing gear and raise the flaps to cruise position. Control feel in the vigilante is sensitive under most flight conditions. In case the pitch org system monitors off, any trim change which occurs can be easily controlled. At operating altitude, practice a stall or two to get the feel of the airplane. In the clean configuration, the stall is preceded by slight buffeting, a high rate of sink, and loss of lateral control. For recovery, ease forward on the stick and add power. In the landing configuration, the stall is also characterized by a high rate of sink and decreasing lateral control. Again, ease forward on the stick and apply power. When practicing stalls with the gear and flaps down, remember not to exceed the maximum allowable airspeed of 230 knots. Intentional spins in the vigilante are prohibited. But should lack of control indicate an incipient spin, move the stick forward for recovery and regain flying speed before returning to level flight. Should you find yourself in a fully developed spin, retard the throttle to idle and clean up the airplane. Place the control stick full aft and with the spin, full rudder against the spin. Recovery should occur in about three to four turns. As recovery occurs, 
neutralize the controls. If you have not fully recovered by squadron altitude minimums, eject. As you start your descent for the approach and landing, be sure to place the canopy defrost switch on and check Bombay cans empty. Enter the pattern according to local field rules. Below 230 knots, lower the gear and flaps. Check the speed brakes at 8 degrees and complete the landing checkoff list. For a normal landing approach, you should have 1,000 feet and about 140 knots at the 180. Adjust your power between 82 and 88 percent in order to arrive at the 90 with 500 feet. As you turn into the final, your speed should be about 130 knots. Maintain power above 80% as the boundary layer control decays abruptly below this RPM. Fly the airplane down to touchdown. After touchdown, bring the throttles back to idle. Hold the nose wheel off for aerodynamic braking. After completing the after landing checklist, shut down both engines. Before leaving the cockpit, ensure that the ground safety pins are replaced. This film has presented the most important operational details on the A3J Vigilante. Study of the flight manual and your own flight experience will improve your ability to fly this aircraft with safety and confidence. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.